have always been obsessed with tales of kooky rich people. I loved the show's Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous and the VH1 show The Fabulous Life Of. I think because I grew up with a single mom who like made art and cleaned houses for a living, rich people's lifestyles seem so absolutely bonkers out of touch that it's always been kind of like a fun zoo exhibit for me. When one of the first rich people reality TV shows dropped, Newlyweds with Jessica Simpson and Nick Lachey, I was absolutely obsessed. Luckily for me, it seems like a lot of people are also obsessed with watching rich people just exist, so we're blessed with tons of shows like Selling Sunset and Bling Empire, and I just eat that shit right up. So obviously when I got to law school and took an estate planning class, which I was dreading because boring, I was pleasantly surprised when we got to the wills section, I learned that rich people are as kooky in death as they are in life. So today I'm gonna go over a smattering of last wills and testaments of the rich and famous. I'm actually gonna spend a big chunk of this on Anna Nicole Smith because her life and legacy have been absolutely nothing but battles over wills and estates. And it's a story that's equal parts fascinating and sad. Obviously I don't revel in the misfortunes of rich people. I'm not that angry, but being entertained by this shit at least feels like punching up, you know what I mean? Me gawking at them really doesn't change the fact that they live opulent, untouchable lifestyles that I could only dream of. All right? They'll be fine. So here's a bunch of kooky celebrity wills. But before we get to that, one fun and non-kooky way to give back is to bequeath your assets upon your death to a nonprofit of your choosing. But maybe you don't have to wait until you die to give back to the world. If you can, why not donate now while you're alive and well? Let me thank my partner on today's video, Ren. Ren is a public benefit company whose website, ren.co, makes it easy to calculate and offset your carbon footprint. By answering a few questions about your lifestyle, you can find out your carbon footprint and how to offset it. You can then offset your carbon footprint by funding a diverse mix of carbon reduction projects like tree planting, mineral weathering, and rainforest protection. The goal is to reduce your footprint and offset the rest. Once you sign up to contribute to projects, you receive monthly updates from the projects you support. So you get to see what your money is spent on. We're well into forest fire season, so I'm really excited about a project that Ren is working on in California, which helps prevent wildfires in old growth forests by removing dead and flammable trees. Then instead of burning the trees and releasing more carbon into the atmosphere, this project heats up the trees and turns turns them into biochar, which keeps nearly all the carbon sequestered instead of releasing it into the atmosphere. The biochar is then mixed with compost and sold to local farmers as a natural fertilizer. Biochar is listed as one of the top five natural climate change solutions in the 2019 IPCC report, and the project has the potential to sequester hundreds of thousands of tons of CO2 every year. This is just one of the many projects that you can help fund through REN. Get started with offsetting your carbon footprint now with REN. The first 100 people to sign up using the link in the description down below will have 10 extra trees planted in their name. That's 1,000 trees. Check it out now at the link in the description below. Give back now before your worm food. Speaking of worm food, let's talk about dead celebrities and their weird and kooky wills. Okay, before we get into the dirty details, let's just talk about wills and estate planning, okay? It's not sexy, it's not thrilling, frankly, but it's important. Even if you don't have any assets, really, each state defines the laws around wills and estate planning, plus there are federal tax laws as well. With estate planning, you work with a professional to figure out basically the best way to put your affairs in order so you pay the least amount of taxes, honestly. There are all sorts of nooks and crannies and loopholes with tax laws that an estate planning professional is gonna know how to make sure that your assets are as shielded as possible from the tax man. One of the first things you learn about in your law school property class, though, is what's called dead hand control. Basically, as much as we do let the rich get away with a lot of tax evasion, we don't want one person to have control over their land forever. So there are rules and wills in estate planning that don't allow someone to control a piece of land forever. Like, they can bequeath their land to their son but they then can't say that that land must pass from son to son forever in perpetuity. It is in fact called the rule against perpetuities and it is the bane of every law student's existence because it's complex and it's hard to know when something is breaking that rule. I'll save you the details, but just know that the law cares about not letting a single person control their property from beyond the grave forever. Okay, and then trusts are separate arrangements that get set up on behalf of another individual. So like a trust fund baby, their parent or grandparent or rich benevolent aunt set up a trust in their name that someone else or a bank manages. And the trust fund baby gets payouts from it or it's used to cover their expenses or it's invested until they turn a certain age and then they get to take control of it. It's another way to make sure your money goes to someone, especially if that someone is under age and can't be trusted with just being given like $6 million at the age of 12 or something. And then a will is a more accessible universal document that you draft or preferably your lawyer with experience drafting wills in your state drafts that lays out exactly what you want to happen or not happen to your assets. A lot of states require it to be signed by the owner of the will as well as two witnesses. Some states allow the will to be in the person's own handwriting. Things get trickier as we'll see when things are in handwriting with no witnesses. And also they get tricky when it's typed out but then someone crosses out something and writes something else in the margin.
margin. It's a mess. The best plan is to get a will in place and get it updated by a professional. Now there are estate planners for what are called ultra high net worth individuals. Think assets of over $5 million, for example. But then there are smaller lawyers and law firms who can help you draft a basic will for far cheaper. There are even websites that purport to help you build your own will for free. And then there's like wills and estate planning for dummies books. If it were me personally, I would opt for a real human lawyer. You literally write the thing once and then forget it. You maybe update it every once in a while, like if you buy a house or have a child or get divorced or married. It's a pretty finite expense. And if you die without a will or with a will that's poorly or confusingly written, your family will be left to pick up the pieces, pay for the funeral expenses, and then figure out what to do with your shit. With a will, you get to dictate what happens to your shit, or you get to at least put any potential arguments at bay by telling your family members what you actually want to happen. So they're not left being like, well, he would have wanted me to get the boat and she would have definitely wanted me to take the kids. Especially if you have kids, you gotta get your damn affairs in order, okay? This isn't even an ad. I'm not a wills or trusts and estates lawyer. Thank God. I just think it's very practical and I've seen what can happen when a dead person's property gets stuck in probate court, creating a long strung out battle over assets. Even if you don't have many assets, the ones that you do have will still get caught up in probate court to figure out what the hell to do with them. And it's much faster and easier for your loved ones to deal with your death if you have a will in place. Okay, and if I haven't convinced you, maybe the following stories of wild wills and estate battles will convince you. So here is a list of kooky, unorthodox, petty, or downright messy celebrity wills. Frank Sinatra, old blue eyes. He was known for being a bit of a womanizer and potentially fathered like quite a few children. He was also married four times and had a considerable fortune worth over a hundred million dollars in 1998 when he died. Because he foresaw that there would likely be a lot of bickering over his estate and potentially a number of people coming forward to claim a piece of his fortune, he put a clause in his will that stated that if anyone contested his will, they would automatically be disinherited. So anyone who came in saying they were owed a piece of the pie would then automatically be entitled not to receive a piece of the pie. Kind of brilliant. Benjamin Franklin, ever the pragmatist, bequeathed upon his daughter a snuff box featuring the King of France's portrait and encrusted with 408 diamonds, requesting, however, that she would not form any of those diamonds into ornaments either for herself or her daughters and thereby introduce or countenance the expensive, vain, and useless fashion of wearing jewels in this country. His daughter complied with his demand, but that doesn't mean that it was left intact. She removed the entire outer ring of diamonds to fund a trip to France. The box then passed from mother to daughter and subsequent generations took more of the diamonds to finance projects and trips. And by the mid 20th century, only one diamond remained, though a number of them have somehow found their way back to the box. And it's now in the hands of the American Philosophical Society. Harry Houdini, the famed magician and escape artist, left a very detailed will, which include a very petty clause that specifically excluded a woman named Sadie Weiss from his estate and made very clear that Harry did not like Sadie. You see, Sadie was Harry Houdini's sister-in-law, twice. She first married his brother Nathan, whom she divorced, and then 10 days after divorcing Nathan, she married his younger brother Leopold. Scandalous. Related to Houdini, I didn't see that this was actually written in his will, but he had an agreement with his wife that whoever died first, the other would hold a seance every year to communicate with the other from the grave. And they had a secret code that they would communicate from the on the grave so that they would know it was really the other person. Houdini died Halloween night, 1926, of a ruptured appendix. Every year after that, Bess, his wife, held a seance on Halloween night to try to communicate with him. She did that for 10 years with no luck. The final seance was held in 1936 on the roof of the Knickerbocker Hotel in LA. Bess admitted that she had never received the message from Houdini. After Bess quit the seances, the magic fraternity took up the practice. And unfortunately, no contact has ever been made with Houdini from beyond the grave. Janis Joplin left $2,500 to throw a posthumous all-night party for 200 people at her favorite California pub. Charles Dickens wanted a modest burial, but bequeathed 1,000 pounds to a young actress rumored to be his mistress. The singer Dusty Springfield left a sum of money for her cat, Nicholas, with instructions that he must be fed imported American baby food, have recordings of her songs played for him at bedtime, and arranged a marriage for him with his guardian's cat. Alexander McQueen left his dogs $75,000. Leona Helmsley, the hotel baroness who was known for being rather tyrannical, was incredibly wealthy. Like, she literally owned the Empire State Building. And while she apparently hated people, she loved loved dogs. When she died in 2007, she left $12 million to her dog. 
a Maltese named Trouble, while leaving only 10 million to her brother and 5 million to her grandson. A court later found that she was not mentally fit when she executed that will, and the sum for the dog was reduced to 2 million, which was enough to cover a full decade of the dog's care, including the annual $100,000 cost of full-time security for the dog, $8,000 for grooming, and $1,200 for food, with the dog's guardian receiving $60,000 per year as payment. William Randolph Hearst, who was quite the man about town, foresaw that there would be many claims on his estate from people alleging that they were his illegitimate child. He bequeathed $1 to anyone who could prove that they were his child. That's one way to deal with it. Farrah Fawcett left nothing to her longtime partner and the father of her child, but she did leave $100,000 to an ex-lover. And then there's Aretha Franklin. Did you know that she was nominated for a Grammy 44 times? Anyway, she died in 2018 with no official will in Michigan. Like I said, each state has their own laws about wills and what happens to property when you die. And in Michigan, since she died without a will, her considerable fortune was to pass equally to her four sons. However, as they were going through her stuff, they found handwritten notes that appeared to be Aretha's final wishes for her assets. In Michigan, as long as the will is signed and dated and in the dead person's handwriting, it counts. So they found a nearly illegible handwritten will from 2014 in which Aretha divided her fortune worth many millions of dollars between her three youngest sons, saying that they were to check on the eldest son weekly and oversee his needs. Her eldest son has been diagnosed with mental illness and has lived in a series of assisted living facilities. So this created an even bigger issue because now, of course, the eldest son is in court contesting whether this nearly illegible handwritten note from 2014 is even valid. But then there were two other handwritten notes that looked like wills, one of which was found buried under couch cushions. And Clarence, her eldest son, his lawyer argues that none of the wills can be authenticated and that they are all contain contradictory instructions or are illegible. Okay, but then in 2021, another will surfaced, this time just a draft without her signature, but it was drafted by lawyers and drawn up in 2018, the most recent draft and closest to her death. Theoretically, a final recording of her actual wishes, but it wasn't signed. It's unclear how this will affect the estate battle, but under Michigan law, it could be accepted as a valid will. In the most recent will, she created a trust for her son Clarence and split up most of the rest of her estate among her other three sons, and then gave some other money out to friends and family. As of late 2021, the battle over Aretha's estate was still ongoing three full years after her death. All right, but that is nothing compared to Anna Nicole Smith. Now she is unique because her life and death included not one, but two drawn out and ugly inheritance battles based on faulty wills. Let's get into the background. While performing at a Houston strip club in 1991, then 23 year old single mother, Anna Nicole Smith, also known as Vicki Lynn Hogan, met 86 year old petroleum tycoon, J. Howard Marshall. They hit it off and he showered her with lavish gifts and asked her to marry him multiple times. And in 1994, they finally got married in Houston when she was 25 and he was 89. That's a 64 year age gap for those of you keeping track at home. And 13 months later, J. Howard Marshall died at the age of 90. And man, I bet the last few years of his life were real fun. God bless. Anyway, the problem was that he didn't update his will after they got married. And according to her, he had verbally promised her half of his estate, which was worth an estimated $1.6 billion, mostly from a 16% interest in Coke Industries. Should I become a Houston stripper? What am I doing here? Anyway, the beneficiary of Marshall's will was his son, E. Pierce Marshall, Anna Nicole Smith's stepson, technically. He was 56 at the time, she was 26. <laughs> Anyway, she joined forces with Marshall's other son, Howard Marshall III, because he also wasn't listed in the will, but claimed that his father had verbally promised him a portion of the estate. You see, he was written out of his father's will after he tried to take control of Coke Industries. How very succession of him. You know what I mean? Okay, so Anna Nicole's husband dies in 1995 and his estate wound its way through probate court until the year 2000, when an LA bankruptcy judge awarded Anna $450 million, which was the amount that the value of her late husband's interest in Coke Industries rose just during the time of their 13 month marriage. But then that was appealed and overruled, awarding Anna Nicole with nothing and ordering her to pay $1 million in attorney's fees to her stepson, Pierce. Then that got overturned and Anna Nicole was awarded $88 million. Then that got overturned on the grounds that the federal courts lacked jurisdiction to overrule a probate court decision because it's state law, not federal law. And then that got appealed up to the US Supreme Court. In that decision, which was written by Ruth Bader Ginsburg, they technically found in Smith's favor, but not that she should be awarded any money, only that federal courts could have jurisdiction over bankruptcy and probate court rulings. And that was in 2005, solidly 10 years after Marshall's death. And then at that point, Pierce dies at age 67 from an infection in 
his widow takes up the case on behalf of his estate. Okay, so then we're in 2006. While this is all going on, Anna Nicole's life is kind of spiraling. She puts on some weight and becomes the butt of everyone's jokes because fat women are hilarious and people love to revel in the perceived downfall of women, especially when they got fat in the early 2000s. And fat Anna Nicole, for the record, was very hot. Justice for fat Anna. And honestly, would we even call her fat? What is she, a size 16 maybe? I don't know. Either way, she's a 10 out of 10 in my book. Justice for Anna. Moving on. So while this is all happening, she's the butt of a million jokes. She becomes a spokesperson for Trim Spa because the only acceptable fat person is the one who's trying to lose weight. She also reportedly begins to abuse prescription medications. And on June 1st, 2006, she publicly announced that she was pregnant with her daughter, Danny Lynn, who was born on September 7th, 2006 in the Bahamas, where Anna Nicole was living with her then partner, Howard Stern. No, not that Howard Stern. This guy was an attorney. They'd been together for a long time, so Stern said he was confident that he was the father of the baby. Then three days later, three days after Danny Lynn's birth, on September 10th, 2006, while visiting his mother and new sister in the hospital, Anna Nicole's 20-year-old son, Daniel, died of a drug overdose, like in her hospital room. Then just five months later, on February 8th, 2007, Anna Nicole was found unresponsive at the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Hollywood, Florida, and was pronounced dead on arrival. It was announced that her death was an overdose caused by a combination of the sedative chloral hydrate plus clonopin, Ativan, Cerax, and Valium, as well as Benadryl and Tobamax. She had also been injecting herself with vitamin B12 and human growth hormone. She was 39 years old. And then the paternity of her newborn daughter was still up in the air. Stern said that he was the father, but so did entertainment photographer Larry Burkhead, as did Zsa Zsa Gabor's husband, Frederick Prince von Anhalt, who claimed to have had a a decade-long affair with Anna Nicole. Okay, but then also some guy named Alexander Dank, who was a former bodyguard and chef for Anna Nicole, claimed that he was the father. And then in April 2007, one month after Anna Nicole's death, the photographer Larry Burkhead was named the father of Anna Nicole's daughter, Danny Lynn, after a DNA test. And the reason that this got so messy? Oh yeah, what am I even doing here? Why am I making this video? Right, wills. So remember that ongoing battle over her dead husband's will? Yeah, that was still ongoing at the time of her death. So there was still that phantom $450 million award hanging in the air. And with the death of Daniel, they all probably assumed that Danny Lynn became the sole heir to the fortune whenever it was finally decided. However, that was also complicated by the fact that when Anna Nicole died, she hadn't updated her will. So it named her dead son Daniel as the sole recipient of her estate and didn't name Danny Lynn at all because she was just born and Anna Nicole died before she had a chance to update. It. In fact, it not only didn't name Danny Lynn, it also stated that Daniel was the only heir, excluding all other children, including those not yet born. So this required a separate court battle to determine whether the will was even valid. In some states, if a parent unintentionally omits a child from the will, the child can contest the validity of the will and potentially receive a share of the estate. But that was also complicated by the fact that Anna Nicole, at the time of her death, was arguably living in the Bahamas. Okay, so the court battle over Marshall's millions continued after Anna Nicole's death, with Pierce's widow taking on his battle, and Howard Stern, Anna Nicole's longtime partner, taking on the role of executor of her estate. Okay, and then rather unbelievably, the case made its way to the Supreme Court for a second time in 2011. Reminder that this case started in 1995. This time the case was before the court on the question of whether the bankruptcy court had constitutional authority to enter a judgment in Anna Nicole's favor. Chief Justice Roberts compared the long sordid tale to a Charles Dickens novel, which is frankly apt, and the court affirmed the Ninth Circuit ruling that had thrown out Anna Nicole's win. So the Supreme Court confirmed that Anna Nicole would receive nothing. After that, the two sides continued continued squabbling over sanctions and discovery abuses, and in 2017, Howard Stern asked the court to reconsider that original 2001 ruling in Anna Nicole's favor for $450 million, saying that the probate court had modified its judgment later in 2014 so that the original ruling in 2001 wasn't a final ruling so they could reconsider it, which got appealed up to the Ninth Circuit, which said, finally, in 2019, that it didn't want to upend the original judgment. And that finally put an end to the estate battle that began in 19. 95. And this is an example of wills and probate court gone horribly, horribly wrong. And how ugly it can get, especially when rich people are involved because they can just hire lawyers indefinitely. In fact, in 2017, the probate judge in Harris County, Texas, where this all began, officially recused himself from the case after 22 years. During a meeting with the parties, he said, and I quote, I am going off the handle officially. I am tired of this case. I've told you that from the beginning. I beg you to recuse me. I beg you to recuse me. I don't want to deal 
deal with you people anymore. This is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. I am not going to spend a lot of time cutting at nits and gnats for people that are fighting over $20 billion, $10 billion that they didn't earn. They didn't create this wealth. It was created by a third party and they're just fighting over it. They can't agree on anything. They can pay lots of lawyers. They can pay lawyers until hell freezes over. But they don't want to agree to anything. They just want to pay lawyers. You're going to have to figure out something to do because I just can't. I'm not going to deal with you anymore. I've had it. I have had it. This is outrageous. This didn't happen overnight. This wasn't done four years ago. Pierce has been dead nine years. It's just not the way I'm going to spend my life end quote. And a week later, he recused himself from the case. He retired from the bench in 2018. And just for context, that judge was appointed to the bench in 1993. So this case spanned nearly the entirety of his whole career as a judge. Absolutely horrific. And then it was handed off to a new judge for the last few years of the case who had to take on the mammoth task of getting caught up in a 22 years long case. And I'm certain that there were many sad lawyers who had to handle these cases over the course of 24 years, either one sad lawyer who handled it for the entirety or a number of sad lawyers who had it handed off to them after five, 10, 15 years and had to get caught up. I hate it. Oh, and Danny Lynn was officially named heir to Anna Nicole's fortune in 2008 when she was 18 months old and a trust was set up in her name. However, I saw conflicting reports as to how much Anna Nicole was actually even worth, especially since Anna Nicole not only didn't end up winning anything from her deceased husband, but also someone had to pay for 24 years of legal fees. But Danny Lynn's dad, Larry, is still an entertainment photographer and she is now 15 years old, looks strikingly like Anna Nicole, and her dad posts a lot of very dadly things about her on his Instagram, which is really sweet. She seems to be living about as normal a life as could be expected after such a sordid and tragic beginning. And that's the tale of Anna Nicole Smith's 24 year estate battle, as well as the end of my list of wild, kooky, wacky, and petty celebrity wills. Thanks once again to my partner on today's video, Ren. Reminder that the first 100 people who sign up using the link in the description down below will have 10 extra trees planted in their name. That's a thousand trees. Check it out now at the link in the description down below. Thanks, Ren. And if you liked this video, you might also like this other video that I made all about Dr. Dre's divorce. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great day. Bye-bye.